All right, now that the recorder is on, so I just apologize again. So this is on the record <laughs> that I kind of messed up here. Um, so I'm going to use an eraser just so that I can show you where you're supposed to make the change. So get, it, get rid of all these minus one in the subscript of Q and K. So that is the correction. So fix that and fix that. And then that one. So now it's done. Now it is correct. How about the KI? Hmm? No, that's the correct one. It's the correct one because um, whatever sum bit you're dealing with is the addition or the result of adding these two. So they're all in the same column, and that's why you know the i remains the same. It's not i minus 1. I minus one refers to the uh, column to the right hand side. And that's only needed when you're calculating KI, then you need to rely on the bits from the column on your right hand side. All right. So are we good so far with this? Yes. All right. Okay. So if that is okay, we're going to continue with <clears throat> the material from uh, from Tuesday, and we got some additional stuff to do today. You know, it's about multi-bit. Okay, it's not a long lab. You know, it's a pretty easy lab to do. Um, it really helps to set us up for the um, carry look ahead editor, which we'll be doing later. Okay, so let me go back to binary number addition. You know, that's the slide that we were working on on Tuesday. And I'm also certainly hoping that um, most people have read, you know, keep up with the reading and have read ahead of me a little bit, okay? Because that really helps in terms of understanding the material um, in this class. Okay, so section six, you know, basically talks about um, a technique to make adders work a lot faster. The problem with the previous, you know, slides is well, in order to calculate your k of 6, okay, for example, it needs k5, okay, but in order to calculate k5, it needs k4, k4 depends on k3, k3 depends on k, so you have a linear dependency, which means if you want to double the size of your adder, instead of adding a 32-bit number, you want to add a 64-bit number, it's going to take twice as long, and that is not acceptable. Okay, it's just too slow to do it this way. So if that is too slow to do, what can we possibly do about, you know, how, what can we possibly do to fix that problem? So section six is about that, okay? So the first thing you need to understand is, um, so I, you know, this is the first time I use this analogy, but I will use it again and again in this class. Um, so think about, you know, um, the material in the class, not just this one, as a forest, as a pine tree forest. There will be occasions where we focus on the pine needles, okay? There will be occasions where we look at a branch, a single tree, and then there will be ch cases where we look at the entire forest. So at this point, I want to explain the reason why carry look ahead is important. So we are definitely not looking at pine needles. We are looking at more like a tree, okay? So carry look ahead is important because it is fast, okay? It makes um, the adder theoretically a constant time circuitry. So a 32-bit adder would end up using the same amount of time to compute the sum as a 32-bit adder. It does not depend on the width of the integer that you're adding anymore. Is that okay? So one method makes it linear, which means 64-bit adder, a 64-bit adder takes, takes twice as long as a 32-bit adder. The other approach doesn't make a difference. Your 4-bit adder works as fast as your 64-bit adder. Don't you think that's what we want? Yes? Okay. So the math that goes along with that, or the logical you know, derivation stuff that goes along with that, is this stuff here. We talked about it last time. I'm not going to repeat that. So the key is ki plus 1, which is the way we start here, equals to this you know, result here. Then you go like, well, it doesn't solve the problem. 
because now ki plus 1 still depends on ki, right? I mean, you know, it's still here. And then the next paragraph, this is the tricky paragraph because uh, from multiple semesters, many people always miss, it's like, where did you define G and P? Can you guys tell? It's right there, okay? But it's not, it's not displayed by itself, okay? So here is how G of I is defined, and this is how P of I is defined. So G of I is a very simple definition. It is simply the conjunction between X, I, Y, I. And then P of I is simply the disjunction between X, I, and Y, I. So one is the conjunction of, the other one is the disjunction of. But by using these two terms, now we can rewrite K of I. Okay, so let me scroll up a little bit. <clears throat> So by using these two terms, now we can rewrite k of i, excuse me, k of i plus 1 as gi or pi and ki. Okay, are we okay with this part? So I'm combining the material that we talked about on Tuesday, the definition of g and p, in order to come to this little equation here, which still doesn't help, right? ki is still there. Well, let's go ahead and use this general equation and see if we can solve um, K1 first, okay? So what do you think K1 is going to look like? I'm, it's down here, okay? You know, if you have a computer or if you have the printed notes, you can actually see it. <clears throat> but if you just substitute it, you know, I so that this is Ki on this side, what do you think I should be if Ki, K1, excuse me, is on the left-hand side? What is I? I is going to be zero, right? So if I is zero, this is, this is G zero, or P zero and K zero. Does that make any sense? Okay, so, so we have K one done. So if I just carefully, you know, disclose, you know, then we know what, what K one looks like. Are we okay so far? Okay, so once we figure out what is K one, we can apply um, the same formula to try to solve for K2. So if I want to solve for K2, in other words, is K2 on the left-hand side of this equality, what is I? I plus 1 has to equal to 2, so I has to be 1. Okay, so if I is 1, then the other side is G1 or P1 and K1. But this time, we know what K1 looks like, don't we? Because K1 looks like this. So we can substitute K1 being you know, just G0 or P0 and K0 into that place and then solve for K2 without having to mention K1 in that particular equation. So we end up with this. Is that okay? So nothing super surprising here. The first line is coming from that general equation, okay? The second line comes from this part here because we solved K1 first. And then the third line is really just expanding, it's distributing you know, the, the term in the parentheses, so we now end up with that. Are we good so far? So the bigger question is, do you think K1 and K2 would take the same amount of time to calculate? But K2 looks more complicated. How can it take the same amount of time to calculate? Sorry? See, but because of parallel operations. Certain operations can be done at the same time, okay? Um, let's first think about, the, think about the G and the P terms. Do, do, I have to do, uh, do I have to calculate G0 first and then G1 and then G2? because they have some kind of interdependency, or can I have parallel gates to solve for all the G terms and all the P terms all at the same time? Which one is it going to be? All at the same time, okay? Because you know, gate op I can just have a whole bunch of gates, okay? Each gate, you know, one gate calculates G0, one gate calculates G1, and so on, and they can all work at the same time. They have no interdependencies. Is that okay? So once all the P and uh, G term, P, G, P terms and G terms are calculated, 
K0 is given, okay? You don't have to calculate K0, it's always there. So when you look at K1, how long is it gonna take? Not counting the, the time to calculate the G and the P terms, well, you kind of need to calculate this additional conjunction, okay? But with that conjunction, now you just need an OR, so you have a propagational delay of two gates to calculate K1. Sorry? Yeah, not counting, not, not counting the time to calculate P, the P, P0 and G0. Because those are all, uh, you can assume those are done already, okay? So is everybody convinced that K1, you know, given that you already have the G terms and the P terms, K1 will only take two propositional delay to get it done? Okay, everybody is nodding, so let me ask you another question. Do you know what, is, what I mean when I say propagational delay? Okay, very good. <laughs> I'm just kind of checking how many people will keep nodding even though they do not understand. Yep. <laughs> say that one more time. So based on this equation, K3 looks like that, okay? But let's go back to the question of propagational delay, okay? So this is what I'm gonna do next. So, um, it's called logic sim, there we go. All right, so we're gonna do it using a logic sim. So instead of hand drawing the pictures, I can just do it here. So what you can do is kind of think, uh, think, of, think of it like this, okay? So we have um, G0, P0. I will label these so you know, it will be clear what we are talking about here. So I'm making the assumption that G0 is already calculated, it is readily available. Um, I'm, I'm assuming that P0 is the same way. And I'm also assuming that K0, well, K0 is an input, so it's always available. So when I go back to the notes here, how do I turn this equation into a circuit? That's the question, okay? Well, I cannot really do the OR until I got this conjunction done. This conjunction has to be done before I do the disjunction. Does it make sense? Okay, so now we pull a AND gate, okay? This is an AND gate. It's way too big because you know, that's the default, so we will make it the smaller one with only two inputs because that's all I need, okay? So I take P0 and then I take K0, okay, into this AND gate. So the result of this AND gate coming out of here is P0 and K0. Do we have any questions about that? We good, okay? So what do we do with that? Well, according to this equation, the result of the conjunction is used for the disjunction, for the OR. So we're gonna do the OR here. So we now we pull a OR gate. So once again, you know, every time you pull an OR gate, it's gonna look like this, way too big, too many input pins. So we just have to make the adjustments to it. Okay. There we go. So this goes straight into one of the pins or input pins of the OR gate, and this one goes to the other input pin of the OR gate. And then the output of this is going to be K1. So let me label this output pin, it is K1. Okay, so do we have any questions relating this schematic to the equation that we just saw? So let me show the equation again, okay? This is the schematic, and then the equation is the one that is high, um, it's this one here, the entire equation. So are we good so far? You know, looking at the schematic and relating it to the schematic. Are we good? So I said that there are two propagational <laughs> delay because the OR gate cannot give you the correct result until both inputs are done, okay? But that means it has to wait for the AND gate to complete first. 
Is that okay? So that's why we have a propagational delay of two gates in this case. Each gate has a propagational delay. A propagational delay basically means from the time the input is correct, has settled down, to the time that the output reflecting the correct result of the calculation, that's the propagational delay. The AND gate has a propagational delay, the OR gate has a propagational delay, and for simplicity, we can assume they are the same. Okay, in this class, we can assume they are the same. So this circuitry has the propagational delay of two gates. From the time that G0, P0, and K0 become available to the time that K1 is computed, it will take the propagational delay of two gates. Are we good so far? Okay. So now we look at <clears throat> K2. Okay. So we look at K2, and I claim that K2 has exactly the same propagational delay, two gates. Are you convinced? Okay. We are convinced because this whole thing can be done with a AND gate that has three inputs. While that is being done, this can be done with an AND gate that only has two inputs, right? This is always there, you know, there's no you know, AND gate needed. When, but these two AND gates can operate at exactly the same time. So they will have the result available also at the same time. So after one propagational delay time, I will have this term, this term, and this term available. Then I feed all three of those into an OR gate, and then the OR gate will take another propagational delay, and then its output is what we want, which is K2. So is that okay? Does everybody understand you know, why K1 and K2, despite the one looks more complicated, but in terms of how much time it takes to compute, they takes the same amount of time to compute. We're good? Yes? No, because that would be your homework. <laughs> That's your homework next Tuesday. So I already gave you one little piece of that homework assignment. <laughs> but I described it. So you can basically you know, use my description, my verbal description, and you know, just make that happen. <clears throat> what about K3 then? Well, do we have any questions about K3 looking like that? Okay, because that's kind of like the definition. I'm just reusing this definition here. So if I use that definition, then I can expand it on the second line because I already know what K2 looks like. K2 looks like this. So if I need to compute the conjunction between K P2 and K2, I can just expand this K2 to this whole thing here, which does not, which only includes K0. Is that okay? And then I use distribution. Now we end up with this one here. So the question now is, do you think K3 will also only take two propagational delays? Yes, it is more complicated. Your gates be become bigger because the last one now has four inputs. There's four input into this AND gate, three inputs, two inputs. This one doesn't need, a, it doesn't need an AND gate. But it only takes two delays. Because these three AND gates can compute all at the same time. The results are also available at the same time for the OR gate to operate. Is that okay? Does anyone want to hand calculate K64? No? I mean, if you work for Intel, don't you think somebody has to do that? And now, because Intel, the I the series processors are 64-bit processors, right? So somebody has to do it. <laughs> Write a script, exactly, okay? And that is not being lazy, that's working smart. So are we okay so far with this? But if, if I just want you to calculate what is K4, do you guys know how to work out K4 so it ends up like this? So K4 depends on K3, expand this K3, do the distribution, and it's going to end up with an AND gate that has five inputs, one AND gate that has four inputs, and so on. Do you see there's a particular pattern here? In other words, 
if I want you to figure out what is uh, K64, um, do you think there's a pattern? You, you just kind of know, okay, it's going to look like this. It's tedious, but I know there's a pattern to it. Do you see a pattern? Huh? Yeah, so there's a pattern because in order to calculate K of I, the last term is going to be P I minus 1, P I minus 2, blah, 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 all the way down to P0, and then K0, okay? The second last term is going to be P I minus 1, P I minus 2, and then down to P, uh, P1, and then you have G0 here. Okay, let me move the mouse pointer away so you can see better, okay? So there's certainly a pattern to it. And that is where <laughs> this formula comes in handy. So this formula looks ugly, okay? And for the most part, you may not even recognize these symbols. What is those you know, big V and the big TP kind of symbol? This is big conjunction, big conjunction, big disjunction. What do I mean by big conjunction and big disjunction? Well, it's a loop, right? How many people know what is, a, what is the sigma notation for summation? Okay, most of you should have some you know, exposure to that. It's kind of the same thing, except we are not adding, we are anding each term, okay? Except for this one, this is oring the terms. Is that okay? You will need to understand this stuff because you know, this is how we can calculate a particular you know, carry bit because we can just expand it like that. Yes? Uh, I cannot remember what I said. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I have the recording. So, so you might want to mark the time. You know, it's uh, 5.54, so it's about 24 minutes into the whole thing. But I cannot re repeat what I just said. I have a general idea of what I was talking about, but I don't, cannot remember what I said. I'll make a perfectly a politician. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. President, what did you just say? Well, check the recording. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, you can prove that too. Um, because this is not 440, I'm not including the proof of this. So for those of you who have taken 440, which proof technique are you going to use to basically say if Okay, let, let, me, let me roll back first, you know, because I do want to make it very clear what I'm saying. So for those of you who have taken 440, this is an application of the material of 440. If I tell you this is the definition, okay, and this is a claim, okay, how do you prove that claim is true? Prove by induction. Proof by induction. So you have a base case, which is K0, okay? And then you have an induction assumption that says, you know, let's assume this works, you know, when M, when M equals to uh, a particular value, and then you work on M plus one, okay? So using proof by induction, this can be proven. All right? Are we good so far? But does everybody understand the nesting of these things? This big OR is, each term of this big OR is this particular term here. This term itself is an AND of the PJ terms, okay? This is entirely one term. This is another term entirely. So this is a big AND of the PI terms but you also have to end the result of all the PI terms with K0. And that's your very last term. Yep? Ah, very good question. You cannot get the very first term out of this. <laughs> because, you, because N cannot be negative. So there's no such first term. So K0 has to be given to you. But you can use uh, this equation to figure out K1, because when you want to figure out K1, N equals to zero, 
which is fine. You know, n can be zero. <laughs> Yes. Is that the same way with all the um, it's not going to be distributed. So you can basically see the whole thing as there's a whole bunch of OR within this one, and there's a single OR here, right? So the very last operation for all of those terms would be a one gigantic you know, disjunction, one gigantic OR. Okay? So each term within the OR. This will generate a whole bunch because you have 0 to n, so there, there are n plus 1 conjunction terms because of this. And then plus 1 more, which is this one over here. Is that okay? Yep. Yep, so if you want to figure out K64, for instance, then N is going to be 63. Okay? Any other questions? So that's N64 is that other N on top? Yes. So if you want to f figure out what is K64, then N is 63, and 63 becomes the bound of this thing here, which is also the bound of this thing. But the inner end does not use 0 to begin. It uses i to begin. So this is nested, right? You have basically two for loops. This controls the outer for loop. This controls the inner for loop. And this is another loop that's outside of that nested loop. Is that OK? Yep. Uh. <laughs> But looking at this, do we, are we still convinced that there are only two propagational delays? One gigantic N gate, a whole bunch N plus one you know, gigantic N gates. Each gigantic N gate gives you a result to feed to one gigantic OR gate. Two propagational delays. Is that OK? OK. All right. I have no idea. <laughs> so are we good with this equation? Does everybody understand how to expand this equation? So we are talking about parity not about the sums yet, right? Not the sum. This is just the carry. So this is just calculating the carries, which means you know these k terms will then be used. You know I have to scroll all the way back to the sum terms, which is where's my sum term? No, it's right here. Yep. So the k terms will be fed back to this equation here to figure out the sum terms. Yep? Um, can you give me an example of the situation for providing an Sure. I'll give you the pseudocode. How about that? So the pseudocode is not going to be a concrete example, but assuming you know, all of you already know how to program in C and C++, that should give you an idea of what that really is. Okay. And if someone says, you know, but I don't know C and C++ loops, then I'm going to have to say, you might want to take CISP 360 again. <laughs> There's a guy that I worked with um, <clears throat> when I was a graduate student. He would have said something a little bit more direct, like, you might want to reconsider another major. <laughs> I'm a little bit kinder, so <laughs> just a little bit. OK, so, um, so this is you know, int k of um, let's see, we'll, 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 we'll choose another term here. So, so this way I can use exactly the same uh, numbers or the same variables as the other one. So inside here, I'm going to use n equals to m minus 1. And then we have a big, uh, one big loop on the outside. So we have uh, index i for i equals to 0 i is less than or equal to n plus plus i. That, this loop here, 
takes care of the big V, okay, the big OR. Inside of the big OR, I have a inner loop, so that's using J, so I have a local variable J here, and J starts from I plus 1, as long as J is less than or equal to N, plus plus J, and this is my inner loop for the conjunction term here, and then we have one more big conjunction term on the outside, so we have a for i equals to 0, i is less than or equal to n, plus plus i, that takes care of the last term, okay? So, now we have to, you know, actually stuff it, you know, putting all the actual content into this whole thing. <clears throat> so we'll go ahead and assume that um, g is an array, p is an array, and then there's also k0, you know, to pass in as parameters, okay? All right, and we also need to have in intermediate results, you know, to, you know, to represent here. So we have, um, this is the all result. So the all result is by default a zero, okay? Because, you know, every time you or, you can turn it into a one, but you cannot turn it back into a zero. And then inside here, we have an interme intermediate result of the end result, which by default is a 1, because you can only turn a conjunction to false as we continue to end it. So within here, the end result is going to be bit, uh, con equals to end result and pj, okay? So line 12 at this point is really doing the, this part here. Once we have the intermediate end result ready, then we can use it on the outside with the OR result. So the OR result equals to whatever OR result was, or the end result, okay? So we are taking the result of the stuff in the parentheses and OR it with the next term, basically. Is that okay? And then this one has its own, you know, end result here, okay? Um, so I'm going to have another lo local variable, okay, and, and result equals to 1, which is used here. So this is going to be and result equals to and result and uh, pj, pi, okay? And when this is all done, we have one k zero to be ended with that too. So n result equals n result and k zero, and that becomes the very last conjunction to be ORed to into the big OR. So OR result equals to OR result OR and result, and that becomes the value that I want to return. So that, there you go. So that's the code equivalence of that notation. So I will display these two side by side and see if you guys have any questions. Pretty sure the recorder is still on. Let me just double check. <laughs> yep, recorder is on, the voice is on, so we're good. So this and that. There we go. Any questions? Yes, because it's Boolean. K of, you know, KM is basically a Boolean because it's a carry bit. Either you have a carry of one or a carry of zero. Yep. So are we good so far? Okay. Which one? On the first line. On the first line? The G terms? Oh, I forgot to put in the G terms. That's a good question because I messed up here. Um, there's an AND. So after the nested AND here, <coughs> AND result needs to be also ended with the G term. So it's GI here. Thank you.
Good job. I forgot that. Because I calculated this entire thing in the parentheses, then I forgot that there's a that there's an end with the GI term. So that's why you know it was not getting used. Yep. So does the clarification of the uh, and is it by the same GI is being multiplied by the term Right. So I'm using the shorthand multiplication is conjunction and the addition is disjunction. So are we good? Questions? No questions? All right. So this code would actually give you the result. You know, it would do the calculation and give you the result. But if you want to look at the expanded equation, then you have to turn um, all of these into string functions. So you'll be just appending a whole bunch of your stuff into a single string. So you end up with one gigantic string that describes <laughs> the equation. So whether you want to evaluate the actual value or generate the equation in text, you just have to change a few lines of code here. So are we good? Yes? OK. All right. So that is basically it for addition. Okay, so, so this is a good time for us to go from the, okay, let me <coughs> go back here. So this is a good time for us to zoom out. This is the pine needle, okay? And then what is the branch? What is one level out? Yeah, what, what were we talking about? Why did I give you this you know, pseudo C code? Because we, I was trying to explain this, right? Why do we know, why, why is this important in this discussion? Because it makes your adder fast, okay? It doesn't matter which carry bit you're trying to compute, it would take only two propagational delay to compute it, right? Why do we need the K terms? Because we're dealing with addition, binary addition. Is that okay? Why do we want to do binary addition? Because we want our computers to actually compute. And addition is one of the most basic operations of computing. Is that okay? All right. So the other thing that is also significant is we look at, the, we, we look at this pine needle here. We see a whole bunch of and, a whole bunch of ors, and stuff like that. But each one can be done using transistors. Okay, but then you will say, but K64 is going to need a whole lot of transistors. That is true too. <laughs> but nonetheless, it can be done using transistors, and that's the whole point. Now we can use transistors to help us implement addition. Are we good so far? So that's kind of zooming out to the tree, you know, at tree level. So if we, if we can do addition, who is curious about subtraction then? Okay, some people are curious about subtraction. The rest are basically saying, no, don't talk about this stuff anymore. We are, we are done. We're done here. <clears throat> All right, so we'll go ahead and look at the next slide and see how it is organized. All right, so we got binary addition. And then the next topic is binary subtraction. And binary subtraction is a pretty short module by comparison, okay? Um, the concept of subtraction is borrow, okay? Instead of carry, you got borrow. All right. So the first paragraph, let me just highlight the paragraph here. This paragraph is a quick review in base 10. Just to remind you, what is the concept of borrow? So let's go ahead and check it out. What is 9 minus 2? 9 minus 2 is 7. How do you know that? By now, you have it memorized, right? But in grade school, how did you learn that 9 minus 2 is 7? Here's a block of 9 units. Here's a block of 2 units. Put them next to each other. 
and you measure the amount of empty space in between, and that turns out to be seven, okay? That's how you learn subtraction when you were little, okay? You know, you literally just you know, count the number of units, okay? Then we go for something that's a little bit more difficult. What is two minus nine? Well, two minus nine is negative seven, but I don't like to look at it as negative seven, because I look at it this way. I got two dollars in my pocket. There's a bully outside of this classroom. He wants to collect nine dollars from me. I don't want to get beat up. So I'm gonna say, does anyone have a 10? Okay, so let's say you have a 10. So you say, okay, Tech, I don't want Tech, I don't want to see you getting beaten up, not today. So you gave me, you bought, you lent me a ten dollar bill. Okay? So how much do I have now? I got my original two dollars. I borrowed $10 from a student, so how much do I have? I got $12. I walk out of the door, the bully said, give me nine. Okay, here's nine. How much do I have left in my pocket? Three. So that's why two minus nine has a result of three, a borrow of one. Is that okay? No, it's a borrow of one unit from the next digit. The next digit turns out that he has no one dollar bills. He only has ten dollar bills. Because I'm borrowing from the next digit who is in charge of a quantity that is ten times of mine in base ten. Is that okay? All right. So are we really okay with the concept of borrowing in the subtraction? In base 10? Okay, we, we got a whole lot of smiles, so I'm assuming it's okay. <laughs> so now we can talk about binary subtraction, okay? The first bunch of subtraction, you know, I'm hoping nobody's gonna have a problem with these. Zero minus zero is zero in base two. Can you buy that? And there's no borrow involved. Is that okay? One minus zero is one without, with a borrow of zero. Would you buy that? Are you sure this is base two? <laughs> okay. One minus one is a zero without a borrow. Okay. This is the only one that is strange. Zero minus one results in a one and a borrow of one. That's it. The reason why that is the case is because I have no money in my pocket. The bully outside wants a dollar, okay? So I say, can I borrow some money from you, okay? But this time, because he is in base two, he doesn't have $10 bills anymore. He has $2 bills. So whenever I borrow, I'm borrowing two, okay? So now I got $2 in my pocket. I walk outside, the bully took one. I have one left in my pocket. So that's why zero minus one is one with a borrow of one. Is that good? All right. So we'll do the same thing as with addition. In other words, we'll try to use logical operations to deal with you know, all of these uh, borrows and results. Okay. So the only difference is this time the borrow cannot be done by a um, conjunction, a simple conjunction. It can only be done by a negation of x and y. So not x and y is how we calculate the borrow when we're dealing with base two subtraction. Is that okay? Is, are you guys convinced that not x and y will give us this particular pattern given that x and y are the way that they are? If you're not convinced, you know, how can you convince yourself? A truth table, very good. So I'm just gonna use a truth table here just to remind you what a truth table is and why it is useful. So we got x, we got y. This is the borrow of x, uh, x minus y. 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. So 0 minus 0 has a borrow of 0. 0 minus 1 has a borrow of 1. 1 minus 0 has a borrow of 0. 1 minus 1 has a borrow of 0. So this is how we want it. Now we look at the equation, not x and y. 
Um, at least one of these two is a zero, so the whole thing is a zero. With this one, x is a zero, not zero is one, y is one, one and one is one. With this one, um, y is a zero, so the whole thing is going to be a zero because it's a conjunction. With this one over here, um, x is a one, not one is a zero, so the whole thing is going to be a zero. So now we can see how not x and y is going to give me exactly what I want. The borrow values can be computed by not x and y. Is that okay? What about result? Well, we can use the same table here, so I don't have to go any further. So the result of x minus y, <coughs> 0 minus 0 has a result of 0. 0 minus 1 has a result of 1. 1 minus 0 has a result of 1. 1 minus 1 has a result, result of 0. Does that look familiar to you? Isn't that the same R function that uh, addition had on Tuesday? Exactly. It's the same thing. So we don't have to deal with that because we know how to deal with the result of a subtraction. It turns out to be the same as the result of an addition. So are we good so far? So some of you may say, Tech, are you telling me the only difference between addition and subtraction is how we compute the borrow function instead of how we borrow, compute the carry function? The answer is yes. That is the only difference. What about that you know, stuff about you know, um, carry look ahead? Okay? You know, would, would that stuff still work? So let's check it out. So we have the same problem with borrowed you know, propagation. So t is the borrow bit, by the way. Okay, So t of i plus 1 is the borrow bit of i plus 1, the i plus 1 column. So here's another big whole you know, gigantic you know, derivation, which you don't have to be able to do, but I hope you can read it and understand it. But let's skip all the way to the end. Okay, so t i minus t i plus one equals to this thing here. So the the result is this thing here. And I'm gonna so so I'm gonna define something, right? I'm gonna define uh, my new g term to be not x i and y i. I'm gonna define a new p term to be not x i or y i. So now we end up with this again. Does that look familiar? With a minor exception, right? We had k before for carry, and now we have t for the borrow. But otherwise, the form looks exactly the same. Don't you think the trick that we did before, substituting k1 into the definition of k2, substituting k2 in the definition of k3, is still going to work? It's going to work, because that had nothing to do with addition or subtraction. It only had to do with the p and the g terms. So as long as I can express t i, I plus 1 as g i or p i and t i, all those tricks can be applied again. So what is that telling you? That's telling you <laughs> that. I, I sure hope this thing is also looking familiar to you. It looks exactly the same. It is exactly the same. The only difference is how we define the g term and the p terms. So the g term was just a simple conjunction between x i, y i. It is now the negation of x i and y i. We just have to negate the x first before we do the conjunction. What about the p terms? It was x i or y i before for addition. For subtraction, you have to negate x i first. So as long as you make those adjustments with the p terms and the g terms, the same structure is going to work. Isn't that a really short module? Well, if that is the case, is there a way to make a circuitry so that it can do both addition and subtraction and use a single bit to control that? The answer is. Yes, 
You just have to control whether you're negating the x term or not. And you can do that very easily because it's just a simple negation. Exclusive or will be able to do that. Okay? All right. So are we okay now with you know addition and subtraction? So the Oops. You mean this one? <laughs> um, okay. So these two are x and y are independent variables. So we we automatically generate these two columns. Okay. This column is what we want. Okay. Because we know the meaning of subtraction. So we say 0 minus 0 does not need to borrow. 0 minus 1 needs to borrow. 1 minus 0 does not need to borrow. 1 minus 1 does not need to borrow. That's why we have 0, 1, 0, 0 with the borrow bit column. This row is computed. It is the negation of x and y. In other words, we're negating this, and then we conjunction with that. So we are negating both x and y, not No, we are negation only x and then end it with y. So, okay, let me make it more clear. So, yeah. hmm. so uh, negation x, y, you know, basically is negating x and y. Is that okay? All right. Any other questions about subtraction? Yep. Okay. So 0 minus 1 has a result of 1 and a borrow of 1. So you're asking about why the result is a 1. It is the same reason why 0 minus 5 in base 10 is 5 with a borrow of 1. Okay, let's 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 do a bully example again, okay? <laughs> so I have no money in my pocket, so zero, okay? X is zero. X is basically how much I have at this time, okay? There's a bully you know, outside you know, who wants a dollar from me. Is that okay? So I don't want to be beaten up, so I ask you guys, well, can, can, some, can one of you, you know, lend me some money, okay? Except you guys are the digit to the left hand side. So when I'm in charge of 2 to the power of k, you are in charge of 2 to the power of k plus 1. So when I borrow from you, I'll be borrowing two times the quantity that I am supposed to be dealing with. Is that okay? So if I'm dealing with dollars, like units, you guys are dealing with twos. Okay? So whenever I borrow from you, I'll be borrowing Two. So you give you 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 lend two dollars to me. I walk outside. The bully took away one dollar. So the result is how much money is still in my pocket. I got one dollar left. So that's why. And the borrow of one is basically saying I have to borrow one from you guys unless I want to be beaten up. <laughs> yep. Correct, yeah. So the idea of using borrow and carry allows me to perform multi-bit calculations instead of just one single bit. Yep, go ahead. Sure, absolutely. Let's go ahead and go through a few examples, okay? Not just one, we can do a few. All right, so this is where you know things get a little bit, well, I mean, it's very hands-on, so it's good. So let's try 0, 1, 0, 0, minus 1, 0, 0, 1, okay? And this is the way I do it. You know, I'm using additional rows to spell out the various steps of subtraction, just like with addition. And I want to label each row as well. This is x, this is y, this is still q, 
This is T, and this is the difference, which I'll call D. Okay? And this particular borrow bit is always a zero because it is already the least significant digit. So even though it's known as T0, which can be a variable, but for this particular calculation, it is a constant of zero. Okay? And now would be a good time to also spell out you know, how each term is defined. Q of i is the result of xi minus yi, which we already know of you know, how to do it. Right? I mean, it's just the um, exclusive or of xy. Okay? T, on the other hand, is the borrow. So this is the borrow of um, xi, yi. Oops, I take it back. T is a little bit more complex than that. Um, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. So, okay, so we have a 0 minus 1 here. This is basically asking what is the result of 0 minus 1? What should that be? We just talked about it. 1. Does it have a borrow? Yes. The borrow goes here because I'm borrowing from the more significant digit. Okay, actually, it's over here because I use a space. Question? No? Okay. So now we have 1 minus 0, which is 1. Okay. Now we have 0 minus 0. What is the result of 0 minus 0? 0. So we put a 0 here. It does not give me a borrow, so I do not know whether there's a borrow from the more significant digit. Now we perform 0 minus 1. What is the result of that? 1. Does it have a borrow? Ah, okay. So that borrow goes here. So once again, just like we carry, there are two chances to give me a borrow of 1. This can give me a borrow of 1. This can also give me a borrow of 1. There are two chances to give me a borrow of 1. Is that okay? Just like there are two chances to give me a carry of 1, in addition, in subtraction, there are two chances to give me a borrow of 1. So now we have 1 minus 0. What is that? It has a result of 1. Does it have a borrow? Nope. Okay. 1 minus 1 is 0. Does it have a borrow? No. So I have no borrow here at all. 0 minus 1 is a 1 with an overall borrow. And then we have 1 minus 0 being a 1. So that completes the whole calculation. Well, I can throw a whole bunch of bits you know, into the editor. So now it's, it's time to check whether it makes sense or not. OK? Yes? The last borrow? The last borrow? Yeah. You mean this one? Yeah. It's the overall borrow. Think of a whole bunch of people in the classroom and a whole bunch of bullies outside. Is somebody has got? Is someone's got? Is someone getting beaten up? <laughs> That's the question. In other words, are the bullies going to demand more money than we have in the classroom? If so, there's an overall borrow. Someone's going to be beaten up. Huh? Sort of. Sort of. Okay. So. But we want to check and we want to make sense of these bit patterns, OK? Because you know, the, the equation that we had is just a whole bunch of you know, ands and ors and nots, right? And these are really just the results of applying all of that stuff. Does it make sense? Okay? How do we make sense of these zeros and ones? Okay? And we can. Okay? That's the whole idea of double checking. 0, 1, 0, 0 is representing which quantity. In, this is a base 2 number, but which quantity is it representing? Four, okay. One zero zero one is one eight and one one is representing nine. Okay? What do you think is one zero one one? It's thirteen. Okay? It's thirteen because it is one plus two plus nine and that's up oh, eleven. Okay. <laughs> Excuse me. Okay, it is eleven. Okay, very good. So you go like, you know, how do they relate? This is 4. 4 minus 9 is supposed to be negative 5. But this is 11. But wait, you're forgetting that we have an overall borrow here. What do you think we're borrowing? 
1, 2, 4, 8, we are borrowing a 16. So if you borrow a 16 and you take away, so you take away a 16 from 11, what do you get? Negative 5. So the whole thing does make sense. Is that okay? So that final borrow, you can look at it as a loan from the bank. It's outside of this classroom. Is that okay? Yep. Say that one more time. T0 is always a zero here you know, because we are not doing chained calculation. So that's why we always put a zero here. K0 is the same in the same boat. So when we're using examples like this, it's always a zero. But if we're using chained calculation, then it may not be zero. So we'll get to chained operations later on. So is that an OK example here? OK. We can use another one. OK. In fact, we can just flip the bits and figure out you know, what's going to happen. OK. So we'll say, let's try 1001 zero, zero, one minus the other one, which is 0100. Zero, zero, zero. OK. We'll see what the, what's going to happen here. All right, so we can we should be able to do this relatively relatively quickly. One minus zero is a one with no borrow. One minus zero is one with no borrow. So we don't have an overall borrow. Put a zero here. Zero minus zero is a zero. Zero minus zero is a zero. We do not have an overall borrow. Put a zero here. Zero minus one is a one, and we immediately have a borrow here. One minus zero is also a one. 1 minus 0 is a 1. 1 minus 1 is a 0. And neither has an overall borrow here. OK. Does it make sense? This is 9. This is 4. This is 5. And we did not need to take out a loan from the, from the bank. Because the overall borrow is a 0. Yep. I, okay, so at this point, you know, we are not dealing with positive versus negative numbers. The concept is whether we are borrowing or not. That's it, okay? So all of these numbers really should be interpreted as unsigned numbers. So they are all non-negative numbers. The only question is, did we end up here borrowing from the bank? That's the only question. But all the numbers are non-negative. So is that okay? Does everybody understand what I just said? All the numbers are non-negative. Okay. So what if you know in the previous case, you know, we, we should end up with a negative number? No. We ended up borrowing from the bank. There's still no negative numbers. Is that okay? So that is the concept that we need in order to kind of move on, you know, to uh, some additional concepts. So are we good so far? Yes, go ahead. What's the T of I? T of I. Oh, OK. So this one is basically, so if I were to define it, it's actually in the notes too. <clears throat> but it is the borrow of subtracting uh, x. OK, let, let me write it first. It's the borrow of subtracting y i minus 1 from x i minus 1. Or, okay, you know, if you prefer the you know, or here, the borrow of um, between the Q and the T of the previous column. So you have the Q I minus one here, and then you have the T I minus one here. So this row are the T's. If you're trying to figure out this particular borrow bit, then you have to. Did I end up with a borrow here, or did I end up with a borrow here? If at least one, if one of these two is, is actually borrowing, then you have a borrow bit of one over here. That's what this equation is saying. Is that OK? All right. 
The structure of a subtractor is exactly the same as the structure of an adder. The only difference is how we define the borrow bits as opposed to how we define the carry bits. That's the only difference. Is that okay? Is everyone convinced that binary numbers is much easier to deal with compared to base 10 numbers? Not yet? <laughs> if I were a politician and um, elementary school students can vote, this is going to be my platform. Binary numbers. So are we good with subtraction and addition in binary? We good? All right. So what is the next topic? I believe it is comparison. How do we know a number is larger than another number or not? <laughs> so we are now moving on to, uh, oh no, we are now going to signed value representation. This is really fun. Because how do we represent negative values? That becomes the next question. Now this is actually not a very short uh, module. It's a little bit long. So a negative value you know, in base 10 you know, is represented by just a negation, arithmetic negation in front of the number to indicate that this is on the other side of the li number line. OK? Pretty you know, conventional way of you know, representing a negative quantity. But what about inside a computer where everything can only be on or off, true or false, zero or one? How are we going to deal with negative numbers? Somebody is going to say, well, we can use zero to represent um, positive and one to represent negative as a sign bit. And then the rest would still mean exactly the same as before. That is one option. But that option has one problem. The problem with that option is you can no longer use the adder and the subtractor that we have already talked about to perform all the calculations. Okay, so we would like to use reuse those circuits, right? I mean, you know, because once it's done, you know, you, you don't want to build additional circuits and use up additional silicon for no particular reason. So now we want to look at the negation operator. Okay, just arithmetic negation. Uh, which is just a, uh, it's basically the unary um, minus symbol. Um, so let's look at some of the properties of negation. Is everyone convinced about this? The negation of the negation of x is just x. And we are not talking about um, logical negation here, we're talking about arithmetic negation. That's good? Okay. Uh, what about this one? If you add the negation of a value to the value itself, you end up with zero. Okay? What if x is negative? Would that still work? Yes. <laughs> it will still work. Okay? This is this works whether x is negative or not. Okay. What about this one here? Is everybody convinced that uh, x minus y is really the same thing as x plus the negation of y? Okay. All right. So now we want to um, define some kind of bitwise operation that has the same properties as arithmetic negation here. Because arithmetic negation is an abstract concept. It's a concept that we understand, but the silicon, the transistors, have <laughs> absolutely no idea of what is arithmetic negation. So we have to express arithmetic negation in some way that transistors can perform. Okay, we have to translate that into operations that your transistors can actually perform. So the first concept that we have to start to understand is, in this class, we don't deal with a number line. We deal with a number circle. Okay? So let's check out what I mean by a number circle. Okay? I'm too lazy to draw pictures and include it into my notes, so I'll, I always have to do it in class. But that's actually not a bad thing. Okay, go to Zerno, and then we just attach a new page after this. So I'll give you a circle. Oops, a 
So you raise the tool. Okay, we'll do a circle. And I put a zero here. So you guys tell me how many bits you want to deal with. I'll give you two choices, three versus four. Okay, I think I hear more fours than threes, so we'll deal with four bits, okay? That's fine. So with four bits, we have 16 divisions, okay? So we got one, two, three, and four. So we chop the circle into 16 you know, pieces, and then we start to number these pieces, right? Okay, so we got zero, one, two, three, four, Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, and fifteen. Is that okay? Anything really surprising here? And that's it. This is the number circle. If you only give me four bits, we can only represent from zero to fifteen. And that's why it's a circle. Well, how come it's not a line segment where 0 is one end, and then 15 is the other end, and then there's nothing after that. Well, because if you add 1 to 15 on a 4-bit computer, guess what you get? You get 0 back. Okay? That's why it's a circle. Okay? Then the next question is, well, okay, I can see how this is a circle, but what does it have anything to do with negative values? No problem. What does it have anything to do with negative values? All right, so let's check out here. It seems like, you know, to increase, I am going clockwise, right? To decrease, I'm going counterclockwise. So here's 12. If I want to subtract 3 from it, I just need to move 3 slots counterclockwise, and I end up at 9. I got the value back. Is that okay? So using that particular method, where do you think I should put negative 1? which is 1 less than 0, where 15 is, right? OK, let's do that. So negative 1 is going to go here, which means negative 2 goes here, negative 3 goes here, negative 4, negative 5, negative 6, negative 7, and negative 8. So now you can see some spots of this circle has two labels. Like this one here, it has you know, the label of negative 4. It also has the label of 12. Hmm, that's a little bit baffling, OK? And then on top of this, let's look at the bit representation. Remember, you guys chose four bits, which means each slot should be representable using four binary digits. Is that OK? So I'm going to use a blue color to do that. So let's pick this blue. So we got 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, whoops, 1, 1, uh, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, uh, 1, 0, 0, 1, uh, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, uh, 1100, 1101, 1110, and finally 1111. Okay, so the blue stuff is the binary uh, representation. The black digits represent the uh, unsigned interpretation, and then the red stuff is the signed interpretation for the negative values. Okay? That is awfully confusing, okay? Basically, the blue stuff is asking the question of, tell me what the states are with these transistors, okay? Let me just randomly pick one, this one here, okay? It's basically saying the first transistor is outputting high, the second one is outputting low, high again, and high again. It's a physical quantity. If you have a voltmeter with a probe small enough, you can actually check it physically and see that and say, Oh, high, low, and high, and a high. Is that okay? So that's just a physical quantity. It has no specific meaning. Is that okay? The black digit and the red digits are interpretations. 
of what it means. Okay, so if you choose to see the four bit pattern as an unsigned value, then you say 1011 is representing 11. But if you choose to say, no, no, this is a signed number, then you interpret 1011 to represent the value of negative 5. Do you think the transistors get to choose which way to go? I think this is a signed number, and therefore it is a negative something. Who gets to choose? The programmer gets to choose. Okay? It's just like how in C and C++, you have signed integers as a type and unsigned integers as a type. You get to choose, not the other way around. The transistors don't care. The transistor is just saying, I'm outputting 1, 0, 1, 1. High voltage, low voltage, high voltage, and high voltage. You can interpret it any way you want. Okay? Let me give you another example. Okay? So now I'm dealing with uh, A bit numbers. Okay? Yes, go ahead. Four fifteen? Oh, you're right. It's got five ones. Nope, it only needs four. So erase this. Thank you. Okay, so let's deal with uh, eight bit numbers. Okay, so I'm going to give you um, an eight bit number of ninety seven. None of that. One of those. It needs one of those. Yep, that's a good one. All right. So this is an 8 bit number, it's binary. And I'm asking you, what is it? I, I'm not giving you any context. I'm just asking you, what is it? Then you go like, well, because of the way we have already talked about values and base conversion and stuff like that. So because of that, you are now biased to look at this and go like, oh, okay, I know what this is. Um, there's one one, no two, no four, no eight, no 16, 132, and 164. This is 97. It's representing the quantity of 97. That's one way. But I can say, nope, this is the ASCII code of lowercase a. If you transmit this bit pattern to a printer, it prints lowercase a on a piece of paper. And I'll be right. If you transmit this bit pattern over a modem, the other side will display lowercase a on the screen. I will be right. But there's one more, there's more, okay? If you go, if you, um, if this is in the graphical memory of an old, old, old computer, a monochrome monitor, okay? Then it will display a dot, no dot, no dot, no dot, no dot, 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 and no dot on the screen. Do you see what I'm saying? There's no inherent correct interpretation what, of what these bits are actually representing. It's just a bunch of zeros and ones. Okay? Okay, then, I mean, this is starting to sound like a Zen class, right? <laughs> you know, there's no actual meaning to anything. It's all good. Okay. Well, if that were the case, I wouldn't have a class to teach. So when does it really matter then? When does it really matter whether we should choose the red or the black interpretation? When does it matter? I'll give you the answer when we compare. Okay? So comparison is sensitive to whether something is signed or not. Okay? Give you an example. And since we have the number wheel up here, so let me ask you this question. I'll give you the bit patterns. And you tell me whether it is less than or not, okay? So um, I'll pick, um, this is a good one. One, 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 one. Is it less than zero, 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 zero? That's my question. Without giving you any more information, without giving you any context, can you answer the question? And the answer, yeah, you cannot answer the question because you don't know um, 
attack, do you want me to interpret 1111 as a signed value, in which case it represents negative 1? Or do you want me to interpret 1111 as an unsigned value, in which case it represents 15? Without me telling you which one is the case, you cannot answer the question. Because 1111 as a signed value, interpreted signed, is actually less than 0000. zero, zero, zero. But when interpreted unsigned, it is not less than 0000. zero, zero, zero. Are you guys seeing what I'm getting at? Okay, so there's no inherent interpretation of a bit pattern. It is only when we get to a point where we need to make a decision, then you have to choose. Which means C and C++ has it all wrong. You really don't need to know whether I is end or unsigned when you're initializing it to zero. Zero looks the same either way. You don't even need to know whether it's signed or not when you're performing addition and subtraction because we have the same adder and the same subtractor that works whether it is signed or not. Okay? You don't need to know whether it's signed or not when you're trying to assign a variable to another variable. You just, you're just copying the value of i to j. You don't need to know whether i is signed or not. The only time you need to know whether it's signed or not is when you are in a loop and you say, if i is greater than 0, continue with the next iteration. Then you need to know. And only then you need to know. But C and C++ gives you the impression that, oh, no, this bit pattern has a pre-assigned meaning here. This is always signed. This is always unsigned. That is not the case. You don't need to know the sign until you are comparing. Then you really need to know. Okay? We are running out of time. Um, so on next Tuesday, we're going to continue with this module. Please read ahead of me because this stuff can be confusing if you don't read ahead of me. Okay? Um, so I'm going to head out to the lab after I shut down everything here.